Seth Eldon, a 56-year-old businessman and owner of a trading company, was content with his life. Together with his wife, he built his business from scratch and achieved great success in the field. He did not complain about the revenue, colleagues, or various unforeseen circumstances, because the work was already established and on track. Seth and Jennifer had a peaceful and trusting marriage. Jennifer was previously active in the affairs of the firm, but recently devoted herself to home cooking and gardening. While reading important papers, Seth was interrupted by a knock on his office door. Come in, he answered simply. Mary entered, wearing a warm jacket sprinkled with snow. The woman had recently started working as a janitor in the office, and it was her second encounter with Mr. Eldon. Mary was holding eight-year-old Drew by the hand, whose hat was off to the side and whose tightly wound scarf was unwound. Mr. Eldon, this boy says you're his daddy. That's why I brought him here. Seth immediately jumped up from his seat. Drew, what happened? Come in. The boy was still silent, and Mary had to explain everything herself. I went to the store to get some detergent, which suddenly ran out. I was walking back by the pond, and suddenly I saw the boys playing on the ice, and then they all ran away. And your boy froze from fear. I guess the ice cracked under his feet. Everyone was scared. I cautiously approached him, took him by the hand, and led him to the edge of the lake. He was so scared. I asked him where he lived, and he said his dad was the director in our building. That's the truth, I'm his dad. Seth Eldon smiled, a little doomed. He then stroked his son's head. Didn't you get your feet wet at least? No, replied Drew, avoiding eye contact. He's a tomboy. Seth tried to explain everything to his employee. I didn't even think he was afraid of anything. Probably, again, he ran away from lessons without warning anyone. What a stubborn boy. All right, it's a family matter. Drew, I'll talk to you at home. As for you, Mary, you may have saved my son's life. Thank you for being so concerned. I'll take him home now, solve the issue, and talk to you again. All right, Mr. Eldon, and I'll go back to work for now. I've got an off schedule. Mary was not embarrassed by her own sad situation. She needed work, and so she continued working, even though she was pregnant. She came to Seth's company a few weeks ago, and told the personnel department that she was expecting a child. But I'm ready to work. You won't have any problems with me, Mary told Mr. Arnott, the head of the personnel department. How do you imagine it? You'll go around the floors with your belly, carrying buckets and rags? Don't spare yourself or our reputation. What if you get sick while cleaning? Then you'll sue us. We know about people like you. You're only after your own profit. Mr. Arnett objected. I don't have any bad intentions, Mary answered. My family is going through a difficult period. I really need this job. Mary's assurances did not convince Mr. Arnett. Luckily for Mary, at that moment, Mr. Eldon was in the office, and he heard the whole conversation. Are you sure you can take the strain? he asked. Smiling hopefully, Mary turned to him and said, I'm sure, 100%. Well, then it's worth giving her a chance, Mr. Arnett. If a person has a desire to work, there's no need to discourage it. We need a cleaner as much as she needs us, don't we? Of course, Mr. Eldon, everything will be done, Mr. Arnett said, looking spitefully at Mary. You have some paperwork to fill out. Mr. Arnett had held his position for many years, and he was strict with his subordinates. Following his own system, and demanding that others adhere to it as well. He disliked when things didn't go according to plan, and the arrival of the energetic and pregnant Mary on staff had spoiled his mood. He believed that she had humiliated him by forcing him to hire her against his first intention. So now, a vengeful Mr. Arnott nagged Mary with various criticisms. Mary, you assured me that you would not fall behind schedule. But I see that it is not the first time, he said in an instructive tone. Perhaps your pregnancy hinders you. No, no, I have no problem. It won't happen again, Mr. Arnett. 
used to answer poor Mary, who was distressed about losing her job. Being a janitor was not her dream job, but she had no other choice. Michael, the father of her future child, was not from a wealthy family, and he too was trying to earn money for a decent wedding. The couple had not expected a baby in their lives so soon, so they were unprepared for the various expenses that would come their way. I feel terrible that you have to get up so early every day and work with your morning sickness, Michael regretted, hugging his bride. I'm a man after all. I have to provide for the whole family. Don't worry, we're both adults and should be responsible for our decisions. Not everyone has money right away. Yes, we rushed, but we can manage, Mary encouraged her beloved. Michael truly loved her and dreamed of a family. However, his mother was not thrilled with his choice of spouse. Sonny, Mary is not a match for you. What were you thinking when you chose her? Mum, don't talk about her like that. You and I have different values. For me, Mary is the perfect woman. That's what you say now. And when the need takes you by the throat, then you'll understand why I wanted someone else for you. You're a good-looking guy, not stupid. You should try to get the attention of someone more powerful. Your father and I couldn't give you a better life, but you have all the qualities to have it. Mum, do you think I'm some kind of gigolo? Michael was immediately angry. I love and respect you, but sometimes you say things that I can't understand. Mary and I will manage. Just don't get in the way. Please. His mother often used her influence on him. Michael was her only child, and she kept taking care of him as if he were still a baby. Several times his mother tried to turn Mary and Michael against each other, but they constantly confronted her with their great trust and love. The young people did not succumb to any of her tricks, and every time they had quarrels, they sorted out the situation and decided to stay together. But Michael's mother believed that she had the right to express her dissatisfaction with Mary because, after Michael met her, he became completely uncontrollable. I don't know what he sees in that girl, she complained to her close friends. Only if Mary were a beauty, I would understand why he's with her. I am almost sure there's definitely something witchy about her. Maybe she's bewitched, my boy. Oh, Sarah, you like to dramatise. Her friend tried to calm the woman down. Don't say that, Mrs. Dawes said. I'd like to see how you'd feel if your son spent all his savings on a wedding to a poor girl like that instead of on his own father's surgery. Yeah, poor Bill is suffering so much, and you're right. Your Michael's priorities have shifted. Meanwhile, Michael's father really liked Mary. Mr. Dawes saw no evil in her, unlike his wife. Mrs. Dawes was ready to enumerate for an eternity why Mary was an unsuitable bride for their son, but not Mr. Dawes. He saw tenderness, care and integrity in his future daughter-in-law. He himself needed expensive heart surgery, but the family had no opportunity to afford it yet. Bill Dawes was the main breadwinner all his life, but now he could no longer work as hard as he did before, and Michael had his own worries with Mary and their future baby. Don't listen to your mother, son. She's always nagging and doesn't always understand things, he said, dismissing his wife's reproaches. I know, Dad, but it's not nice. Mary doesn't deserve to be treated like that. She treats my mum with all her heart, and she's always pushing her away. Mum should finally get over our coming marriage, especially because Mary is carrying your grandchild. She'll get used to it, Bill consoled his son. You'll see. I know her well. On the day of the near tragedy at the pond, after talking to the boss, Mary continued cleaning the office, and Mr. Eldon took his son home. He didn't give Drew an educational talk. The boy sat pouting, as if he had been insulted, though his father did not even reprimand him. When Drew arrived at home, he lowered his head and presented himself before Jennifer. Well, what happened again? she asked tiredly. After all, such visits home were becoming more frequent. Skipping classes, he was playing with the boys on the pond near our office, 
and almost fell through the ice. If my employee had not taken him away from there, he would have fallen under the ice. Drew, you can't do that. You have to think a little bit about your actions and imagine the consequences. Your prank is very dangerous, Jennifer frowned. The spouses tried not to raise their voices, intimidate their son or punish him strongly. Drew did not accept their words and continued to do whatever came into his head. But the spouses did not give up and remained understanding of his behaviour. Promise me that you will no longer walk in dangerous places, Seth gently but insistently asked his son. Drew frowned, but realised that everyone was waiting for his answer. Okay, I promise, he said. At times, Seth felt he was not a good enough parent. He knew how to conduct business, press his partners, and get them to agree to certain terms of the deal, as well as make an impression and use his influence in the business sphere. However, he did not understand how to behave with an eight-year-old boy. When Seth returned to the office, he immediately asked to look for Mary and invited her to him. Fifteen minutes later, Mary entered the director's office after a polite knock. Have a seat, please. How are you feeling? Nothing hurts after today. I'm fine, don't worry, I'm not hurt. Mary smiled. After her first meeting with Mr. Eldon, she had a good impression of her boss. Not every big business owner would worry about their employees, take care of them, and show gratitude. Mary, I want to say thank you very much. I am ready to write you a bonus because you have been so attentive to my son. You're about to become a mum yourself, and you understand what I'm experiencing right now. No, Mr. Eldon, you don't need to give me any bonuses. But I have a request. What is it? I'm listening. I need three days off. My husband and I are getting married. It's a small one, but it requires a lot of preparation. Why don't I pay for it? Seth offered easily. I'm serious, Mary. Accept my gratitude. Whose services should I pay for? Photographer? Banquet hall? I can afford it. Besides, I'm very pleased to contribute to such an event. Thank you, Mr. Eldon, but that's too much. We won't be able to accept such a gift. Mary even blushed. She did not expect such a broad gesture. While such spending was trifling for Seth, she could not imagine easily parting with such a sum of money. I am sincere. Don't refuse. I won't give up anyway. I can see you're a good person. To be honest, not many people at work know. But we recently adopted Drew. He's stubborn, uncooperative, used to fighting for his place in the sun in the orphanage. And here he has everything. But he hasn't realised it yet. My wife and I don't scold him too much. We don't want to scare him. You know, I grew up in an orphanage myself. I understand what you and your son are going through. Orphans can be challenging. But you'll get through it. I can see that you care. And Drew is a good boy. His temper and distrust are showing now. But he will relax when he realises that you will not give up on him. He's already been abandoned once, so he doesn't trust you and scares you away. As for me, I came here to earn money from another city, but met my love here, and now we're expecting a baby, Mary said. If it's a boy, I'll name him after you. And please come to our wedding with your whole family. We'll be waiting for you. Seth did not refuse the invitation. Mary was pleasant to him, and Drew also wanted to see his saviour again. Jennifer, my dear, we've been invited to a wedding next week, Seth announced to his spouse. My new employee, who took Drew off the ice, invited us. Would that be appropriate? We don't know her at all, the woman hesitated, but was interested. Are we going to the wedding? Drew ran out from around the corner into the centre of the room. Can't hide anything from you, little prankster, the father smiled at Drew. Will this event make you happy? I've never been invited to a wedding before. I don't know what's going to happen there. Come here, 
Jennifer beckoned to her son. First, I'll tell you how the celebration goes, what the bride and groom do, and what the guests do. The main thing for you is to memorize that you need to behave appropriately and look nice. The boy listened to his foster parents without interrupting. For him, the new world of his family seemed exciting, yet unreliable. The strangers, who now took care of him, were attentive and kind to him, but it was hard for the boy to believe that he would not be abandoned again. Drew couldn't really call them mum and dad yet, but he really wanted them to make it work. Drew tried his best, but none of his old tricks worked. His antics used to make the tutors mad, but Seth and Jennifer seemed different. They were patient, attentive and kind. They were in no hurry to limit Drew or punish him, and the boy was beginning to realise that he could take away his prickles and let the adults love him. I understand. I'll behave so I don't embarrass you, said Drew after the educational talk. He went to bed thinking about the upcoming ceremony. The same evening, on the other side of the city, there was another conversation. As soon as Mary rustled the keys in the hallway of the apartment, Michael immediately met her. Hello, my sunshine. Michael kissed the bride on the cheek and addressed his unborn child, putting his hands around her belly. What did you and Mummy do today? Was she worried? Everything was fine, Mary replied with a smile. After her story about rescuing Drew, Michael was very frightened. Are you crazy? What if you had gone underwater together with that boy? He asked, looking at Mary with undisguised displeasure. How could you risk yourself and our child? Don't you think so at all? You're always trying to help everyone. They won't even thank you later. Michael, don't get upset. Here I am, unharmed. Why worry? If I hadn't reacted in time, one family would have had grief today. You're the main rescuer in the world, aren't you? Please at least don't risk the baby. You're not alone anymore, and you're not only responsible for yourself. Michael didn't back down, knowing he had a right to be angry. I understand you. I'm sorry. I promise I won't jeopardize our lives again. I didn't even think about it. I just did it, that's all, Mary admitted, realizing that she and Drew were just lucky today. After a brief altercation, Michael cooled down. He knew who he was going to marry. Mary was kind-hearted and could never pass by those who were in trouble. Although these traits attracted Michael to her, he was afraid that one day they might put her in danger. After bathing, Mary settled comfortably on the sofa in front of the TV. Michael stretched her tired legs, put a pillow under her head to make her more comfortable, and left her to rest. Meeting Drew stirred Mary's memory. She remembered her orphan childhood in the orphanage, all the difficulties, and the main question that tormented every abandoned child. Who were her parents? Mary did not remember anything about herself. She only knew, from her teachers, that she had been found at a bus stop when she was three years old. "'You were such a sweet,' Marina said to her one day. The kind tutor put her whole soul into her upbringing and genuinely cared about every child in the orphanage, despite the whole system. "'You had no belongings and no distinguishing features. Not a note. I remember the morning when you were first brought to the orphanage. At first you were silent, unable to reconcile yourself to the change of scenery. There was not a single familiar face around. Everything was new. Many kids, routines. I've met kids like that. I was afraid that you wouldn't talk because of psychological trauma. But after a couple of days, you became more active and found a common language with others, explained Marina. Mary had nowhere to get more specific information about her early childhood. The police were unable to find her relatives and had no record of her parents, although several nearby towns and villages had been alerted. The only reminder of her past life was a silver pendant on a chain in the shape of a heart. It had an engraving with Mary's name on it, from which Marina had learned her name. This important clue 
forced law enforcement officers to visit every jewellery shop and interview all the jewellery dealers in the markets. But that did not help either. Mary wore the chain with the pendant, dear to her heart, only on special occasions. She did not want to show it off all the time and planned to wear it on her wedding day. For several days in a row, Mary constantly called Mr. Eldon, whom, to her great surprise and objection, undertook all the costs of the upcoming celebration. The young woman consulted him about the price, not wanting to be impudent. Mary already realised that Mr. Eldon would not refuse his offer, so she accepted it. The upcoming great celebration made Mary dizzy. She had never felt like a princess from a fairy tale before, but her wedding promised to be just that. Wow, sighed Michael, seeing what kind of banquet hall they had thanks to her boss's efforts. Mr. Eldon is a wonderful man. That's right, Mary laughed, taking her groom's hand. We'll be surrounded by such beauty. We deserve it for once. With Mr. Eldon's help, Mary was able to take care of the banquet hall, the musicians, and the toastmaster. As a wedding gift, Mr. Eldon ordered a local music band to entertain the guests. Wow! What a feast rolled up! exclaimed Mrs. Dawes, walking around the hall, which was decorated in the early morning of the day of the wedding. I don't believe some rich man would be willing to spend money on this for nothing. What are you talking about? asked Mary, suspecting some hint in her mother-in-law's words. I think maybe you're having a fling with him. That's why he's so generous. Maybe the grandson isn't mine at all, said the woman angrily, and she kicked out an eyebrow stubbornly. You're out of your mind. God forbid. Mr. Eldon is old enough to be my father. What an imagination you have. Mary waved away, deciding not to spoil her mood on such a day. No matter how hard Mrs. Dawes tried, but she could not make her daughter-in-law mad and upset the wedding. She did not resort to decisive action, knowing that her son would not forgive her. So she had nothing to do but pester Mary with petty mischief. Mr. Eldon, Jennifer and Drew were ready to leave for the restaurant. Jennifer really wanted to meet Mary and express her gratitude for saving her son's life. Drew wore a classic suit tailored to his figure proudly holding a bouquet of white roses. He volunteered to congratulate the newlyweds and hug his rescuer. Are you worried? It's going to be fun there. You'll love it. Maybe you'll even invite some girls to dance. I can't dance, Drew said, immediately embarrassed and turned away to the window. Don't worry. Daddy and I will show you, Jennifer encouraged. It's not difficult, but it's very pleasant. Seth and Jennifer complimented the tastefully decorated hall and the impressive kitchen. The celebration had around 40 guests. Drew was the first to run up to Mary and hand her a lush bouquet. The second was Jennifer, who couldn't hold back her tears at the sight of the bride's tender appearance. Happiness to you. Take care of each other. This is the most important thing, Jennifer said hugging the bride and groom in turn. Thank you very much, Mrs. Eldon. Mary smiled back at her. We are truly grateful to you, the groom added. This feast would not have been as bright without your participation. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Don't mention it. You saved the most precious thing for us. Jennifer drew her son to her and stroked his shoulder. By the way, he wanted to congratulate you very much. He couldn't wait. He even dreamed he was here. Well then, I'll dance with you. Mary winked at Drew and he blushed. When Mr. Eldon's turn came to congratulate the young couple, he hugged Mary and then suddenly recoiled when he noticed familiar jewellery on her chest. The pendant in the shape of a heart. He would never forget it. It was strange that Jennifer had been so engrossed in the festivities and pleasantries that she hadn't noticed this piece of jewellery. Mary, where did you get this? Mr. Eldon asked, unable to tear his gaze away from it. Mary was alarmed by the question. She immediately wrapped her fingers around the small silver heart and began 
twirling it nervously. "'It's the only thing left to me from my parents,' she said in a low voice. "'I had no other things. The police used it to search for my father and mother, but is it familiar to you?' "'It can't be!' Suddenly Jennifer gasped beside her husband, and at that moment he blacked out from reality. He could no longer take in what was happening. His name was being called from all directions, but it was as if the words didn't reach his ears, blending unrecognisable sounds. Mr. Eldon's consciousness plunged into the distant past, into the time when he himself was still a child. He grew up pampered by his parents, who rarely scolded him for pranks. They instilled good manners, knowing that their son would definitely grow up to be a big shot. Little Seth was inquisitive and cheerful. People always gathered around him, calling him the soul of the party. Seth got used to success. He often went to sports competitions, performed with poems and songs, and participated in school plays. His parents were proud of Seth, and believed that he would attend a prestigious university. And so it happened. The son did not disappoint their expectations. In just a couple of months, after entering the university, he became a real star of the faculty, which no one left unnoticed. Situations where most people were lost, he took as a challenge. The cheerful nature of the curious guy could not fail to attract girls. Jennifer immediately discerned a charismatic young man at the birthday party of a mutual acquaintance. However, she did not hurry to develop an acquaintance. And how do you like Seth? He has no girlfriend at the moment. Shall I give him your number? Her friend asked her. No, you shouldn't. Jennifer cut her off. She believed that guys around whom there were a lot of noise and girls were usually not worth trusting. I don't think he's serious. I wouldn't go out with him. Well, you should. Seth is a decent guy. You can count on him as a friend. Jennifer's plans didn't involve Seth paying attention to her. Later on, they remembered how Seth tried to get Jennifer's attention and how strict she was with him. I wanted to give up almost immediately because I was tired of you not giving me a pass. Jennifer shared her memories. And why have you so long pretended that you were not interested in me? Perplexed Seth. It was interesting to see what other tricks you would try. She laughed. It was important for me to know that I'm not just a trophy for you. Seth's family was warm towards Jennifer, knowing that their son would never choose an unworthy woman as his wife. Jennifer was close to her parents-in-law, almost as close as she was with her own parents. The first few months of their married life were filled with happiness. They soon wanted to have a child and did not delay the pregnancy. However, their lives were overshadowed by Jennifer's severe toxemia and dizziness. Let's live with my parents for a while, Seth suggested to his spouse. I'm constantly at work and I can't focus on anything knowing that you're here alone. And if something happens to you, I won't forgive myself. You're right, Jennifer agreed. It would be better this way. I don't want you to worry about me. By the way, you got so thin when things went up. Financial prosperity is nice, but then there's not enough money to put you back on your feet. Please take care of yourself as well, and don't forget to eat. I know, honey, I know, but now is the peak. Seth excused himself. If I let up at this point, we may never reach this level later. Be patient. I'll do my best to be home more often. And Mum and Dad will look after you. Okay, dear, Jennifer said. She had unsolicited tears in her eyes due to raging hormones that made her sensitive to everything, even when she didn't want to show how upset she was. At her parents-in-law's house, Jennifer was really calm and constantly under supervision. She could immediately get help if she started to feel dizzy. Little Mary was born prematurely, but it didn't harm her health or her mother's. Jennifer was exhausted from the pregnancy, but now she was glad that everything was over. What a cute baby! Seth sighed, 
looking at his daughter through the window of the maternity hospital. He wasn't allowed in the ward, so he had to look at his baby from afar. Seth, I can't believe that this is our creation. I just got used to the belly, and now the baby is born. The whole family took care of little Mary, surrounding her with love and attention. She was growing up with the love of many people. The girl never gave her parents any major trouble. She quickly internalized what was explained to her, and Seth was crazy about his little girl. Daddy's daughter, everyone who saw Mary said with a smile, an exact copy. That's the most offensive thing, laughed Jennifer. So I surrendered for months on end, and now she looks just like her daddy, and she's always clinging to him. On Mary's second birthday, Seth gave her a unique gift, a silver heart-shaped pendant. And since then, Mary has never taken off the beautiful jewellery and proudly showed off her father's gift to everyone. Jennifer and Seth lived contentedly, believing that they now had everything they needed. They looked toward the future with a smile. The family also had loyal and trustworthy friends. During gatherings, the children played together and little Mary easily mingled with the other children. Thanks to his wealth, Seth could afford to buy any toy for his daughter, whether it was a new Barbie doll, a scooter, or a new bicycle. As the family's trading business grew, so did their house. They added another floor, changed the furniture, expanded the yard, and installed a swimming pool. For little Mary, they built a small pool with steps, where she could splash around under adult supervision in hot weather. Her childhood was carefree and pleasant. But one day, everything changed. That day, they were going to a friend's wedding. Seth was worried, noticing that his spouse wasn't feeling as well as she claimed. My dear, shall we stay at home? I can't watch you suffer. Don't be silly, go without me. You haven't rested in so long and Melanie and Zachary will be upset if neither of us attend their wedding. They won't forgive us. We see them often enough as it is. They'll get over it. You're more important to me. Mary doesn't understand such events yet, and I won't be able to sit knowing that you're alone. Don't be too overprotective of me, retorted Jennifer. If I feel horrible, I'll call a doctor. All right, then. Take care of yourself. We'll get ready. Seth reluctantly agreed. So Seth got Mary in the car and they set off on a long journey. They had to spend more than six hours on the road. Seth worried about his wife, left home later than he intended, and for half the distance he was already driving in the dark. When it was not more than a hundred kilometres to the destination, Seth stopped at an inconspicuous gas station to refuel his car but after driving only a couple of kilometres away from it, he was forced to stop in the middle of the forest, on the roadside, because he realised that he had a punctured wheel. Damn, that's all I need, swore Seth quietly, looking back at his sleeping daughter. When he got out of the car, the man began to look at the car and think about what to do, and suddenly he noticed the headlights of the approaching car. The car stopped, and three men got out. Seth immediately realised that the flat tyre didn't happen for nothing. "'Hey, man, what are you hiding in there? Give us your money, quickly,' asked one of the attackers in a cocky tone. "'Guys, I have nothing of value. Look for someone else,' Seth replied simply. He didn't want to provoke a conflict, but he thought it was silly to appear unconvincing too. Don't tell us what to do, the second attacker added, looking at Seth with a clear threat in his gaze. Look, I don't want any trouble, but I don't have any money, said Seth, but he didn't realise there was no way to avoid trouble. The first blow hit him in the chest, and his breath caught quickly. Then two of them grabbed him, and the third began to beat him, to incapacitate him, and stop his resistance. It ended with Seth being thrown almost unconscious into the ditch. After the impact with the ground, he passed out and remained lying there for some time. No one would have known his fate 
if a local elderly man riding early into town on his bicycle had not shown vigilance. Are you alive? Hey, man, wake up! Elderly man was frightened and patted Seth's cheeks. But the beaten stranger did not open his eyes. Elderly man probed his pulse and made sure that he could still be saved. We must go to the paramedic immediately, he muttered under his breath and rode his bicycle to the village. Meanwhile, the bandits did not notice that there was a little girl sleeping in the chair behind them. They drove all night to sell the stolen car to their accomplices and get money for it. When it dawned, one of the bandits who was driving the car turned around and only then noticed the sleeping girl. After quickly stopping and talking to the other bandits, they cut the seat belts that held the seat in place and dragged it out of the car with the sleeping girl. Leaving the seat on a deserted bus stop 400 kilometers away from the unforgettable gas station, they fled the scene of the crime. In the meantime, thanks to the actions of Michael, Seth survived but never regained consciousness. When Jennifer received a call from the police of an unfamiliar town, she was almost deprived of her senses. Is Mr. Eldon your husband? Yes, and what happened? Jennifer's heart immediately skipped a beat. The unbearable weight of the bad news came upon her. He was found unconscious. He's in the hospital now. He's in a coma because of a head injury. Jennifer could hardly remember that time. Not only had her husband recovered for weeks, and the doctors gave no guarantees, but Mary was missing. The only person who could shed any light on her disappearance was in a coma. The family did everything possible to find their Mary, but no one knew where to look. She's still a baby. She does not know anything except her name. Jennifer could not calm down. Grief consumed her completely. She was powerless, and Seth could not help her in any way. My poor girl, where is she? Mother's heart burst with pain. Her parents-in-law supported her, trying to appear strong, but the fear for the life of their own son and granddaughter did not go unnoticed. For six months, Seth was in a coma. Jennifer had long ago moved him to his hometown and provided the necessary care. She had to take over the management of the firm, which previously seemed beyond her strength. Seth's father, who had passed on his talent for exact sciences to his son, helped her get into the processes and gave her advice. In addition to taking care of the family, Jennifer tried to keep the business afloat so as not to go bankrupt. The bills for caring for her spouse were not insignificant. Seth regained consciousness just as the nurse was in his ward, and the attending physician appeared soon after. After an examination, it was clear that the head injury had not caused any changes in behaviour or senses. Oh, what a relief, sobbed Jennifer, hugging her beloved husband, but she didn't know how to tell him about Mary. The news hit Seth hard, and grief overwhelmed him. I'd rather be dead. I wish I had stayed, and she hadn't gone. I couldn't keep her safe. I couldn't protect our baby, he exclaimed desperately. He realized that he had failed to protect neither himself nor his child, and now Mary was in an unknown place. How did you bear it all alone? he asked Jennifer, but she had no answer. I don't know. I just lived and hoped that some day I would get a call saying that Mary was found. With Seth it was easier to experience grief. Sometimes the spouses quarrelled, and cruel words flew from Jennifer's lips, blaming him for Mary's disappearance. Other times she blamed herself for not going to the wedding and not being with her daughter when Seth tried to fight off robbers. We don't know how it could have been, he consoled her. A new round of investigations brought some hope to the couple. We found your assailants, the investigator said over the phone. They're being questioned now. Thank you for letting me know. I'll be there soon, Seth replied. Despite Seth's connections keeping him informed about the investigation, it did not bring him any closer to his daughter. 
At the interrogation, it turned out that the bandits had no intention of attacking Seth specifically. They occasionally robbed travelers, but it was all light, casual work. We didn't know this man, said one of the assailants, unable to bear the pressure. We saw him for the first time, and we didn't know anything about the daughter at all. Why do we need a three-year-old girl? We just took the money out of his wallet and drove on. The car was left there in the woods. The rest of the gang said the same thing. Neither Seth nor Jennifer felt any relief after catching the attackers. They had hoped for an entirely different outcome from the interrogation. The last thread that connected with Mary was lost. Seth, I can't take it any more. Where is she? Why isn't anyone thinking about the missing child? And why can't we do anything? We have so much money, but they don't give us anything useful, cried Jennifer, feeling her strength waning. The couple often fought, but they still held on to each other. Do you think we should give up? Seth asked carefully. I'm ready to fight to the end. It's my fault and I have to find her. Several years passed before Jennifer and Seth tried to conceive a second child, but Jennifer's weakened body and health problems had made conception difficult. They faced new problems, and Jennifer often cried and wailed after hysterics. Why is this happening to us? Have we ever hurt anyone enough to deserve this? No new medical devices or examinations with doctors could guarantee that Seth and Jennifer would be able to become parents again. They did not lose their determination, and for the next three years, they continued to try, but none of their attempts brought the desired result. Jennifer and Seth were well known to a wide circle of people, many of whom were aware of the family tragedy. How are they holding up? People whispered when the spouses appeared at an event. I can't imagine how hard it's been for them, you wouldn't wish that kind of grief on anyone. The gossipers' tongues were still wagging. I heard that they tried to have another baby, but all in vain. What kind of family is there without children? What do they work so hard for? And who will they leave it all to? Many people were seriously concerned with the question of to whom Seth would pass all his fortune. Every year the success of his firm was growing, and he could compete with those who had never known of its existence before. But for Seth and Jennifer, their business became the only way to get away from their pain. They got busy with work, devoting all their time to it, burying themselves in it, and completely forgetting about the comfort of home. Business deals, contracts, reports, and new staff became much more important to them. However, business was no longer enjoyable and did not bring happiness. Over time, Jennifer began to realise that their once happy and promising marriage had become empty. Seth was still attentive to her, did not raise his voice, always listened to her and made gifts. But the spark was gone. The meaning was gone. It was just a way to kill time. Nothing more. Seth, I want to talk to you, said Jennifer to Seth after dinner. I think you'll understand me because we always understand each other half-heartedly. I'm listening to you, said Seth, moving from the table to the sofa and taking his wife's hand. What is the topic? I want a child. You want one. Why don't we adopt him from the orphanage? We never considered that option because we thought we could manage on our own, but we couldn't. My life is empty. I don't enjoy it at all. I'm like a robot. Every day is the same and it's joyless and I want to be a mother. Seth didn't even need time to think about it. I agree. Only, let's adopt a boy. Yes, a girl will be too painful, nodded Jennifer, who hugged her husband with a smile. Drew was almost eight years old. The boy was stubborn and resentful. He had been growing up in an orphanage since he was four years old, and had already learned the injustice of life to some extent. His birth parents were alcoholics, and they had no time to take care of him. He was sent to the street to beg, because there was no food in the house, only booze. Neighbours fed the boy and constantly appealed to the social service, and soon Drew was taken away from his parents. His life in the orphanage 
was not sweet either. The other boys were cruel and liked to bully. That's why Drew grew up so uncontrollable, ready at any moment to react to someone else's action. But gradually, the participation of Jennifer and Seth in his life softened him and made him believe in them. Mr. Eldon! Mr. Eldon, wake up! The first thing Seth saw when he opened his eyes was Mary's worried face. She was still as beautiful in her white, festive dress. Jennifer was sobbing beside him, who, like her spouse, understood everything. Are you all right? Michael helped the man sit down and handed him a glass of water. Mum, Dad, why are you crying? A confused Drew looked at them. Don't be afraid, sweetie. Mary stroked his cheek and pulled him close to her. They're all right. They're just upset about the wedding. At a wedding, people always cry with happiness. But Drew was not satisfied with this answer. He did not believe that his parents cried from happiness with such faces. He saw their pain and embraced Jennifer. You are our girl, Seth said faintly. Are you sure they're adequate? Michael whispered to his fiance. Should we call an ambulance? I don't like this. Mary, Jennifer spoke up. This pendant was given to you by your father on your second birthday. It was him, she said, pointing to her husband. You are our missing daughter, Mary. Jennifer burst into tears again. Michael sat Jennifer down at the table as well. He began to realize what was going on. Are you saying... You are Mary's biological parents, he clarified. Yes, the couple replied in weak voices. After the confession, the four of them retired to a separate room to discuss everything quietly. I'll watch your boy, Mrs. Dawes volunteered, though she was terribly curious about what was going on. I can't believe it, Mary said detached, coming to her senses after realizing what had happened. You realized me just from the pendant, right? But you didn't know me at first sight. Sweetheart, don't get upset. Michael patted her shoulder. You were only three, and now you're an adult. They couldn't have guessed. You should know we never left you, Seth said. The story is very complicated. When you disappeared, we searched for you for several years. We lost hope, but we kept seeking. The police prosecutor's office already hated us. It's hard for them to communicate with those who have lost children. They have to be cruel. The conversation was long and emotional. Everyone experienced a storm of emotions and thoughts and wanted to ask questions. The guests were sympathetic to the short absence. To be 100% sure of their relationship, Seth, Jennifer and Mary decided to take a DNA test to determine the degree of kinship. The result came in a few days. Now we are officially relatives, Jennifer concluded, smiling awkwardly at her daughter. I've dreamed of this day for so long. Can we hug you? Seth asked cautiously, spreading his arms apart. Mary answered them without words, stepped forward and hugged her family. She cried silently, reunited with her family. Michael was next to her, and couldn't stop smiling with happiness for his beloved. After meeting her parents, Mary's life changed radically. Seth and Jennifer immediately looked for spacious housing in the city for their daughter and her husband. You'll need a good place to live, Jennifer coaxed, alluding to the grandchild in Mary's belly and possible future children. From here it will be convenient for you to go to any part of the city, nodded Seth looking at the startled faces of the newlyweds. Mr. Eldon, this is too spacious for us, Michael exclaimed. On the contrary, it's just right for you, answered his father-in-law. Nothing is to be spared for the happiness of children. And since she has chosen you, you are a worthy man. I see how dear she is to you and how sincere you are with her. Besides, my grandchildren will grow up here don't stop them from enjoying it. Michael laughed and shook Seth's hand. He had seen how Mary had blossomed since meeting her mother and father. Her parents took care of the furniture, the family car, 
and even Michael's future. If you're interested, I can help you find a job in the field you're interested in. I offered Mary a job in our company since she is an heiress. She will have to be trained and I will personally take care of it. But for you, we have a place too. So decide, Mr. Eldon said. Thank you. Mary and I will discuss it and I will let you know. Mrs. Dawes's attitude had changed markedly. When she saw Mary in Michael's apartment, she almost burst with envy. Oh my goodness, she gasped. What a great place. And how will you live here with just the three of you? Why so much space? You'll get lost. It seems like that to you now, replied Mary with a smile, but you'll get used to it and you won't notice the space. Now Mrs. Dawes proudly declared to her friends that her daughter-in-law was not a homeless orphan, but a wealthy lady from a family of businessmen. She had softened considerably towards Mary after she had asked her parents to help Michael's father and pay for his surgery. Of course, Seth replied, we are relatives, after all. He has such serious health problems. You can't turn a blind eye. Thank you, cried Mrs. Dawes. We are indebted to you. You are so wonderful. Your daughter is also so wonderful. Mary wanted to laugh at how malleable Mrs. Dawes had become. Despite the abrupt change in her life, Mary justified her dad's hopes and was quickly drawn into the company's business. Even though she was pregnant, Mary accepted her post with all seriousness and worked with great dedication for the family business. Already in her second month in a senior position in her father's company, Mary was able to figure out the mole. He worked quietly, and because they were accustomed to him, the team did not arouse suspicion. But Mary seemed more attentive. "'Well done, daughter,' admired Seth. "'You found out about the scoundrel in two steps. I took pity on him, gave him a job, and he tried to stab me in the back.' Mary laughed, rejoicing at her success. Such luck gave her confidence, and the support of her relatives played a huge role. Mary's waters broke right at her workplace during a meeting. I think the baby is going to see this world, Mary said, looking around her team with a frightened look. Call Mr. Eldon, someone ordered. Soon Mary's relatives rushed to the clinic from different parts of the city. When will it be over? Michael paced the hallway nervously, looking for support from his loved ones. "'It's not a quick matter,' his mother answered. "'You'd better have a snack, son. That will help to calm down a little.' "'I don't want to eat. How can I rest here when Mary is suffering right now?' "'Darling, listen to your mother,' Jennifer turned to him. "'You can't help Mary. She is going through a natural process. Everything will be all right.' The best doctors are here. They'll take care of her. Despite Jennifer's bravery, Seth held her hand because they were both worried. The changes in their lives had happened so rapidly that they didn't have time to get used to them. Having just acquired a son and daughter, now they were about to become grandparents. I guess I've just become an uncle, said Drew, when he saw the midwife coming towards them smiling.